Welcome back. Democratic incumbent Kimberly Daniels will face two primary challengers in the race for Florida House District 14. There's no Republican challenger, but there is a write-in candidate, Brianna Hughes, who's also running. Uh, joining me is Teresa Wakefield-Gamble, one of the candidates challenging Daniels in the Democratic primary for State House District 14. And I welcome you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Being the lucky guy who's covering Nassau County elections right now uh, <laughs> for WJCT, uh, I am aware, certainly, of, of the district. But first of all, what is the district? Where is it geographically? The district is uh, very unique. I call it a purple district because it really touched every side of town. So we're talking about North Side, which is Dunn Avenue, Northwest, Newtown, near EWU. We have San Marco, the historic district. We have Arlington near JU. We have also um, East Side near the stadium, the Port Authority. We also have a little bit of West Side off of Macduff and Beaver Street. So it touches just about every side of town in Jacksonville, District 14. But this district was uniquely redistricted for the current incumbent because my colleague, Rep. Nixon, beat her in 2020 for District 13. Okay. We should also mention that Lloyd Cockler, uh, Cocker, former pastor at Gospeller Ministries, is the other Democrat running in this race. Okay. The district then covers everything yes. multiple issues yes you talk east side we're talking the city maria development you're talking arlington uh we just talked about the the bridge to arlington is is a concern um you're talking north side newtown crime issues yes. uh service issues mm -hmm. um <laughs> it's a lot what are some of the challenges or have i only touched upon like the tip of the iceberg there the other challenges you have the homeless population where our state has the legislation to criminalize the homeless folks and last night I was at the city council meeting to learn that the city council just cut $10 million from Mayor Deacon's affordable housing budget. So you, the mayor has a solution to fix the homeless problem, but now the city council done took away the funding for her to do that. So, and most of that homeless population is in District 14, which is a minority, majority district, a 30-plus 30, a 30 Biden district. So that's basically where our black and brown community members and taxpayers reside. So that is an issue, is addressing the homeless. The next is um, underserved, unemployment. They don't have livable wages to pay the rent. So the rent is um, impossible for them to meet. So they're working two to three jobs. So my campaign had to be run differently because most of the people in my district, they're either working two to three jobs. They're not home for me to door knock. So I have to reach them where they are. So we got to deal with giving them livable wages. In order to do that, we need corporations to come into District 14 so they can, in their own backyard, where they can work and afford the rent. Since our city is on, um, city council is taking away that funding for the mayor to do that. Then we have the criminal, the crime issues that you mentioned earlier. And the reason our crime is so high is because they don't have those employment opportunities. A lot of folks have been laid off. A lot of them are homeless because they can't maintain shelter. They're constantly being moved. They're either living in hotels. See, all these issues exist, and the current incumbent has not addressed any of that. As a reporter in this city for 40 years, those challenges have been discussed for decades. Exactly. Um, the crime rate in some areas, if we had programs to train students mm -hmm. for jobs, mm -hmm. if they could get placed in jobs and find there's an alternative, Certainly heard that before. We were discussing yesterday with the mayor the homeless issue, and I was at a press conference on that homeless plan. So here are issues that are we're aware of mm -hmm. and we're working on. Right. It just seems like the latest version of what I've been covering for years. Does that discourage you that we've been working or discussing these for decades? No, I want to say it discouraged me. It's just the right people are not in office to resolve the situation. You got some people in office, they just holding the seat for the power, but they misusing the power and they misusing the tax dollars in the city. We have the revenue as well as the governor of the state of Florida and they're holding on to it. So that's why I have been doing a lot of educating in my campaign for people to realize if you vote and you pay taxes, you demand growth in your community. So that means we have to have the right representation to make sure they bring in the tax dollars back to the district and not assuming that they're doing the tax dollars. I took a tour through the district and I will be coming out this week with actual proof that those tax dollars have not came back to District 14. Okay. 
Don't forget, you can give us a yell. You can talk to the candidate for D- District 14 at 904-549-2937. And we've got Carnell from downtown with a question. Carnell, you're on the air. Hey, how are y'all doing? Fine. Look, um, what I want to know is specifically dealing with American descendants of slavery. How do you delineate what appropriation laws look like, number one? And dealing with black America in the state of Florida, how do you plan on breaking down the subgroups to reform the appropriation process? Are you specifically going to be looking at targeted communities? Number two. And number three, a third response to that is that that needs to be some type of form of reparation commission put together to identify those individual uh, families that have been discriminated against because of their lineage. Now, I'm taking a conservative standpoint because when I look at appropriation laws, not just on the federal level, but also on a state level, a lot of funding puts the whole black America of the state of Florida all in one pot, and it's not a direct impact. Now, I want you to be specific and don't give me a runaround, but I want to know direct actions to the appropriation process and how you're going to delineate. Let's let her answer the question if we can. Go for it. Hi, Carnell. I I understand your plight. I am a daughter of a um, slave descendant, and I understand your position with appropriations. And the current incumbent actually sat on the appropriations committee. And first, we got to deal with the policy and legislation, how appropriations is distributed in the state of Florida. So we got to correct the legislation and the policies first. And when we can get that corrected, then we can move forward to the next step of you meant about the dip putting us all in one pot, in one particular group. And that's where we, as me as the incumbent, will invite individuals such as yourself for us to craft the legislation on what that uh, reparations appropriation will look like for the state of Florida. That is not a decision for just one, the incumbent to do. This is a community decision. That's why in my campaign, I say putting community first. And this is what community first looks like. It's having conversations with voters like yourself to let's come to the table and find out and craft the legislation on what paying reparations to black America in Florida would look like. Because until we undo what they have already done over the last decade or so in the state of Florida, we can't begin to give a solid solution on what that will look like. We got to clean up the legislation first and we got to make it workable so we can be able to craft the legislation and put it through. In other words, we reverse engineering. We're going to do the work first. We're going to write out the plan first. We're going to write out the vision first. And we're going to also involve the community on how it needs to be dispersed. Then when we present it to the floor and the state and the Senate House in Florida, then we can um, execute the plan to make sure those funds go where they need to go and make sure we have good stewards in place throughout the state of Florida to make sure it's dispersed appropriately to the descendants of black slaves. Okay, we're talking to Florida House District 14 candidate Teresa Wakefield-Gamble. You are a Jacksonville native, granddaughter of a black farmer, third-generation preacher's daughter, daughter of a union, International Longshoremen Association, uh, 34 years a wife, mother of two married sons, uh, and you've had some adversity uh, yes, uh, recently, um, uh, some surgeries and other issues, right? Yes. Last year, um, for the last 12 years, I was dealing with a lot of invisible illnesses, a lot of um, medical conditions that the natural eye could not see. So I had a lot of battles with the healthcare professional system, and I had to undergo three brain surgeries last year in 120 days because I had a brain aneurysm that went undiagnosed for 12 years. The doctors knew it was there, but they never communicated that to me, and I felt like I was disenfranchised. So I had to choose whether I was going to file a lawsuit and go after those doctors or save my life. So I chose to save my life. And I was able to do that strategically, having the right insurance coverage with Florida Blue and working with Baptist Healthcare System and Ascension Healthcare System to make sure all my surgeries was covered almost a half a million dollars. And I did not have any out of pocket, but a lot of the average voters in Duval County and in District 14 do not know how to navigate that space. 
because of my past work history, corporate experience in healthcare, I know how to do that. So as a um, uh, candidate running for office, that's what I want to do is educate the constituents, not just to give you access to your tax dollars, tax dollars, but teach you how to get the right insurance coverage, how to pick your right doctors so you can improve your quality of life. So, Therese, you have written a book about this called Guarding the Gift, um, and I'm sure that took up a lot of time there. So why are you running for this? You already have a very full plate, sounds like. <laughs> More than just the book. The book is the journal that I kept throughout this whole process last year. So it's it will be published in November 5th, which is also my birthday. And I'm also pursuing a dual doctorate degree in education leadership in trauma-informed practices and social-emotional learning next fall in November. So I that's where, with my work ethic, being a granddaughter of a black farmer, a daughter of a union worker, and a wife of a union worker, I have and a mother of two sons, I have the work ethic to multitask. That's how I was raised. So this race is important because the time is now. Being the daughter of a preacher, how does your faith uh, mold who you are? My faith mold who I am is how not to listen to the noise and the rhetoric and to keep me rooted and grounded. Because to be honest, faith is really about character development and how we need to be uh, and present ourselves. We have all us live by a code of conduct from our children all the way up to our work life and even as a legislator. We have to do things in decent and order and with decorum, but we also know that this role is not for ourselves. It's to serve the community and putting them first over profits is my goal. Now, you uh, you have been critical of your opponent, mm -hmm. uh, the incumbent, uh, Kim Daniels. You call yourself the real Democrat. Yes, sir. You call her the fake Democrat, Republican puppet, anti-abortion advocate, anti-labor. Uh, give me just some for instances as to why those uh, are being uh, tossed at her. The reason they're being tossed is very simple. Her voting record. In its public information, you can go on the Florida People's Report card. She has an F. Everything Democratic values stand for, she voted against. So her record is the reason she has been tagged those names by reporters. That wasn't tagged by me. Reporters are tagging her. But if it aligns with her voting record, I'm not going to dispute it because she made that possible. And along with her words that came out of her mouth. That's why we have to be mindful. And that's why my faith come into play to make sure my character is represented, not just for me, but for the people I'm seeking to serve. Now, we did invite Kim Daniels to come on and do one of these. And so far, we've not heard back from her. Mm -hmm. um, and she's in the middle of her third term in the House, originally elected for House District 14 back in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think you do a better job? First of all, I wouldn't have a voting record like Kim Daniels. Um, secondly, she have not invested tax dollars back into the district. She says she has, but after my, after my constant tour of the district, she has not. We have schools being boarded up, public schools being boarded up and closed, and then charter schools popping up some, right down the street. We have folks that's homeless. We got affordable housing shooting through the roof. We have food deserts in um, District 14 should not be heard of when everybody pay taxes. So she's misusing her power and she's misusing taxpayer dollars. And you have a lot of endorsements right now, don't yes, you? Yes, I do. I have a total of 19. Including LGBT groups, Planned Parenthood, Environmental Caucus, Black, Asian, Hispanic, and Muslim caucuses. It sounds like the community that you aspire to, to work with is aspiring to have you there. Exactly. They are put, and there's more endorsements to come. I just learned this week, Mom Demands Action, um, Mom Demands Action, they just endorsed me with the gun safety law, which go along with my public safety, safety message. These endorsements is not to, you know, rack up. These um, caucuses have members. These members are voters, and those members have family members that are voters. Quick last question. You'll sure. be in a minority if elected. Uh, is that... Uh an issue right now? Will you tackle that? Of course I will tackle that. You know, a lot of times we are always assumed to be the underdog. I don't think I'm an underdog. I'm just telling everybody, don't sleep on Teresa V. Wakefield Gamble because I'm the real Democrat in this race and I will put you first and put people over profit.